service of worship. We have some new faces and some familiar faces in the Presbyterian healers today. Maybe you would just take a few minutes and go around the table and introduce yourselves to us. John, would you start? Just introduce yourself to the rest of us. We already know John, but we don't know everybody else. Sydney Story. Mark Morganell. Austin Gallus. Gail Morganell. Amy Wordman. Mark Hammond. Anita Gilbert. Jalen Story. Jenny Langdon. Thank you very much. Thank you to the new people. It sounds like you've been playing together for a long time. You really melded very well together. So thank you for opening our workshop. Let us join our voices together and call to worship as created in your bulletin. What are you waiting for? May your unfailing love come, come to me, Lord, for your salvation, salvation according to your promise. My, my unfailing love, love will, will not be shaken, shaken nor my covenant of peace be removed, says Lord, the Lord, who has compassion on you. God, God who has loved us. This is how God showed his love on us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. We love because he first loved us. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. We respond with love. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love another. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, glow yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We are saved because of love. The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Love comes with Jesus' birth. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. What are you waiting for? Our hymn is number 41, O come all ye faithful. You are encouraged to stand as you are able or to you.
Advent is a time of waiting. We wait in hope. We wait in peace. We wait in joy. As we wait, we are filled with love. Love for our God, love for others, and yes, love for ourselves. We love because God first loved us. God loved you so much that God sent his son Jesus Christ into this world to save you. Nothing can satisfy our longings except God's love. Today we light the candle of love. As we wait, let us be people of love. Let us sing together the candle of hope as printed in your bulletin at the back of your bulletin. to smooth out those places made rough by our human sin. With humility and hope, let us voice our confession in the unison prayer of confession. Great God, as we behold the birth of Jesus again, we are mindful of how we have failed to receive the fullness of that gift. The story points us to your glory. Yet we struggle to join in the song of praise and thanksgiving. We are distracted and confused, so focused on things that matter little, that we overlook the good news of great joy that you have prepared. Tell us again the Savior is born. Tell us again that we are forgiven. Tell us again that we can be, can be abundant in faith, hope, and love because of what you have given us, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, hear us now as we each offer our own silent prayers of confession.
In Jesus' name, amen. The angel tells Joseph that the child forming in Mary's womb is to be named Jesus. Call him Jesus, the angel says, for he will save the people from their sin. From his birth through his resurrection, from age to age, Jesus is about salvation. Friends, this is good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen and amen. Let us stand together for our Gloria Patri. If Jacoby, Sidney, and Mom come down and join me down front here. We're going to stand over here by the table. You guys, yeah. you guys know what this display might be called? 
Can you identify any of the characters in this? Okay, very good. And a major, right. We call this a nativity scene. Do you have one, something like this at your house? Yeah. Were you working on one in Sunday school too? Coloring your house? Yeah. Yeah. So nativity scenes have a long history. They go back to about the end of the 13th century when a man by the name, who was a monk, Francis, he was worried that people were too, too invested in giving gifts and not remembering that we were supposed to be celebrating Jesus' birthday. And so he was trying to figure out how to get people to change their focus of attention. Why don't you all come and stand behind here at the table? And so he was in a little Italian village. He was going to go and have midnight mass. They were going to have church. And when he got, when he got to that little village, he decided the sanctuary was going to be too small for all the villagers that he thought would come. So he got permission from the Pope and he decided he would have church outside. So he found a cave up in the hillside. He asked for local farmers to bring some of their animals, some cattle and some sheep and some ox. And he recreated the stable scene without any people. This was just with animals. And this was so powerful to the people when they came for midnight mass and saw this beautiful display of all these animals and the manger everything ready for Jesus' birth, that the word soon spread, and many, many churches in Italy then had living nativities with the animals. And then over time, people added characters, because first it was just the animals in the empty stable, like waiting for Jesus to come. And people copied those and made statues for their churches, and then for their homes, and soon, they were very popular, and then they began to add the people, Joseph and Mary, and the shepherds, and sometimes the kings, and all the nativities were made of different material. This happens to be ceramic, and most of the nativities would reflect the um, traditions of the countries they lived in. Like, look at this color here. This one looks very different, doesn't it? Look how many people are dressed. They're from Central, this came from Central America and represent Central America. This one on the table is more European looking. And um, so there are all kinds of materials, but the main characters, who do you think the main characters should be? Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Uh, what's missing over here? Jesus is missing, that's right. Well, Jesus isn't going to appear until Christmas Eve. And then Jesus will join the rest of the people. And see the shepherds, they're far off in their fields. Everybody's waiting for Christmas when Jesus is born. So we have lots of things in the Christmas season that remind us of Jesus. We have candles and have wreaths, all of those things. The wreaths remind us of Jesus' everlasting love. The lights and the candles remind us that Jesus was the light of the world. So the nativity scene isn't just a pretty thing. It is to help us remember, like St. Francis wanted, the gift that God gives to all of us in Jesus Christ, the gift of love. And it's not about giving gifts to one another, although that's how we show our love to one another, isn't it? But the primary thing is to thank God for the gift of Jesus Christ. And so we can be reminded of that every time we look at a nativity scene, whether it's big or whether it's little and tiny like this one. And so I hope you get yours done upstairs today. So, but at the center of it all, and the most important thing is the babe of Bethlehem, which is Jesus. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for the many reminders of your love and the power we see through all the symbols around us this time of year, from the wreaths that tell of your ever-present love to the candles and lights that remind us you are the light of the world, to an activity scene, small or large, a reminder that Christ's birth was not in a palace, but in a simple stable, and that Christ came to earth to bring salvation to all. Thanks be to God. Amen. And you can go back, and I think Miss Ronnie has, is ready for you upstairs.
please join me in the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, illuminate these words by your spirit that we might hear what you would have us hear and be who you would want us to be. For the sake of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 16. Listen to God's word. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. It is not enough to try the patience of humans. Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will conceive and give us to you a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy, boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. Your answer. Thank you, Daryl. I know this is not very traditional, but I want us to sing the story of Mary and the Annunciation. So number 19, hymn number 19, stand as you choose or as you're able. And you will sing the story that I need to back when Our scripture reading comes today 
from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name of Jesus, because he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In these final days leading up to Christmas, often it is Mary that gets the spotlight. Mary's experience is often the focus. Luke's gospel is the one that has the fullest account of Mary's encounter with the angel, her questions about the announcement that she would be bearing the child of God. Mary said yes to God, despite the cultural and religious challenges she faced. And Luke lifts up Mary's voice and her experience. We hear Mary's voice in her song, the Magnificat, her song of God's blessing and allowing her to be the mother of God and her prophecy about Jesus. And Luke also gives us the details about the trip to Bethlehem and Jesus' birth that we see in so many of our nativity scenes. Yet in all of this, we don't hear a word from Joseph. We hear a little bit about Joseph, but he had no voice in Luke's gospel. He was mentioned only in passing. Yet Joseph is so critical to the story of Jesus' birth that we wouldn't be surprised to see him reappear many, many times throughout the scriptures, throughout Jesus' life. But we never actually hear Joseph speak. We don't know a lot about Joseph. We learn a little bit about him from Matthew's gospel. He describes him as a craftsman, a carpenter from the town of Nazareth. Nazareth, Matthew tells us Joseph was a righteous man, suggesting that he might have been viewed in his community as we might view an elder or a deacon or a teacher or a respected businessman. Joseph's standing in the community was important to him, as was doing the right thing, both for Mary and for himself. Put yourself in Joseph's sandals for a moment. You've just heard the woman you're engaged to is expecting a child, and you know it's not your child. Just as Mary may have asked, why me? Joseph also wrestled with similar questions. Matthew gives us a window into Joseph's thinking about what happened between this couple. If you've ever found yourself in the proverbial rock and hard place, you probably have an idea of what Joseph was going through. There seemed to be no or clear answer to his dilemma. Joseph pondered what was the right thing to do for him, for Mary, for their future, should they be together or apart? So many questions. Author Stormy Orton, Ortman used Matthew's account of Joseph's dilemma to give Joseph a voice and consider how he might have handled this dilemma following Mary's news. The following that I'm going to share with you is a depiction from her book entitled The Gnawing Question, and she based it on Matthew's, this passage from Matthew. An angel of the Lord appeared to me, Mary explained. He said the Holy Spirit will come upon me and I will conceive. 
He said, I will give birth to a boy, and he will be God's son, promise, the promised Messiah. And I know even now this has already happened. Mary, what are you saying? Joseph said. I know the scriptures promise that the Messiah will be born on earth one day, but, but things like this don't happen to ordinary people like us. Try as he might, he couldn't hide his disbelief, his lack of trust for what she was saying. He didn't mean to hurt her by his reaction, but he could see in her eyes that he had. Unfortunately, they didn't have much time to talk before Mary had to leave with her family to go home. After she departed, Joseph's heart was filled with doubt. It tortured his mind night and day and pained him half through the night. He had so many questions. He was unable to fathom any possible answers. One gnawing question persisted. Is she telling the truth? And now, sitting alone in the darkness of his room with just the moonlight filtering through the window, he wrestled with the answer. Tormented, he couldn't sleep. Joseph thought, the Mary I know wouldn't do such a thing. It's not in her heart to deceive anyone. She could never be with a man who's not her husband and then lie about it. I'm certain she wouldn't. Yet there's only one explanation for an unmarried woman expecting a child. He rubbed his forehead with his fingers, trying to massage away all these thoughts. He recalled, she said, the child has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. What am I to believe? I fear she's betrayed me. She's been led astray somehow. Did someone entice her or force himself upon her? Joseph's anguish rose again, his chest tightened. He thought, my dreams, our dreams of the future are shattered. How can I marry her now? Even if what she told me is true, how can I marry her? He put his head in his hands and he prayed, God, show me what to do. I want to be a fair and a just man. I love Mary. I don't want to make of her a public disgrace. And being a man of high character who was always obedient to the laws of God and government, Joseph knew that Mary could be stoned to death for adultery. He could never allow that to happen to Mary. Joseph thought, even if I choose to believe her story, and I'm sure no one else will, I don't want to expose her for everyone to see. How can I protect her from the shame and danger that could come to her when people find out? Of course, there will be some public awareness when I legally unbind this, but I will do this as quietly as possible. Yes, yes, he said to himself, that's the answer. I'll draw up the required papers of divorcement and let her save face. Although I've thought of her as my wife for so long, this will be hard to do. Oh God, help me do what I know I must do. Relieved to have come to a conclusion, even though it was a difficult one, Joseph fell back into his bed, sound asleep. But in the midst of his sound sleep, he had a dream that was so vivid, it was as if he had been awake. In the dream, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, full of light and accompanied by the awesome presence of God's glory. Joseph, son of David, said the angel, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sin. When the angel was gone and the dream ended, Joseph woke up with such a start he had trouble catching his breath. Gasping, he sat up suddenly. He could remember every vivid detail of the angel's visit. The awesome sense of God's presence he felt in the dream permeated the room. And immediately came to his mind the words he heard spoken by rabbis in the synagogue as they read the scriptures. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Joseph got up and went to the window and looked down on the starry night. He caught his breath. Mary, my Mary is the virgin, he said with great wonder. 
Oh, Lord, he cried as he fell to his knees. Forgive me for doubting her. Forgive me for doubting you. I've seen it in the dream. I know I have heard from you tonight. It's easy to understand why she has found so much favor with you, that she will fulfill the prophecy of the coming Messiah. It is too great to comprehend. He wiped the tears from his eyes, but they wouldn't stop flowing. Thank you, God, I'm no longer troubled and torn. Thank you that I can wed Mary, the person I love. Thank you for the privilege of caring for her and this child of promise. And I promise she will remain a virgin until the Messiah is born. Joseph, who'd been kept awake because of his anguish, was now kept awake because of his joy. He could hardly wait to tell Mary about this dream and that God had spoken to him. How he regretted meeting her happy news with such shock and sadness and disbelief. He knew it must have hurt her. Still, he must seek her forgiveness right away and apologize for his inability to understand, to comprehend. He could hardly wait until daylight. I will go to Mary and I will ask for her for permission to speak to her alone. I'll take her hand and I'll say to her, Mary, forgive me. I didn't understand. I am so sorry. I know it seemed like I didn't trust you. You had shared the most glorious news ever to be heard on earth. And I didn't accept your story. I promised to spend the rest of my life making this up to you. He lay back down to wait for daybreak, but his mind wouldn't rest. He suddenly recalled how his own father had often traced their family lineage back to Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, Boaz, Ruth, Jesse, and King David. Suddenly, he sat up with a start. He put it all together. I'm, I'm that descendant of King David, spoken of the scriptures, he thought to himself, and I am just a simple carpenter, and he smiled softly. God used Joseph, a righteous man, to be Jesus' earthly father. He was not a priest or a king, he was a carpenter. It wasn't easy for Joseph to recognize that he'd been called to be a part of God's plan. To understand that this birth, this child, was not Joseph's plan, this was God's plan. Joseph was a man with, answer, with questions who pondered the right thing to do for himself, for Mary, for this child. Yet Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, never intended to make a name for himself. Yet we can never forget Joseph. He's critical to the story. And on the night that Mary gave birth, Joseph likely gathered that baby in his arms, and like his father before him, named that child. Joseph said, you will be called Jesus. And later, Joseph responded to angels who appeared to him in his dreams, following the instructions to take his family out of, uh, out of Herod's way, and then later to return to Nazareth. Joseph was an active participant in God's plan. And Mary and Joseph, like their ancestors, Abraham and Moses and Joshua and Esther and Ruth, all said yes to God. All put God's plan ahead of their own. In saying yes, Joseph let go of his reputation. He chose discipleship. He chose Mary and Jesus. They were the only ones surprised by God's call. In the accounts of Jesus' birth, there was Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. There were the shepherds in the fields who on the night of Jesus' birth looked into the sky and saw myriads of angels. There were the wise men who took up following a star to find a child who was prophesied to be greater than them. All were a part of sharing the good news of Christ's birth. All who meet Jesus have their lives changed. God breaks into the world in a variety of ways, through a baby in a manger, a star in the sky, the song of the angels, or a dream. You'll never know where our trying God might break into your life, surprise you with a question that requires your response. When the question comes, may you respond like Mary and Joseph, saying, yes, Lord, and may you be blessed and changed by our triune God's work 
in and through you. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us go to God in a time of prayer. Praying God, we gather with gratitude this day as we await the day of celebration, the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we wait with strength, come, Lord Jesus, bring your strength, bring your peace, bring your life. Come, Lord Jesus, bring your love, bring your compassion, bring your mercy. Heal our division, seek out the lost, restore the guilt ridden, widen our efforts, teach us generosity. Show us how to forgive. Come, Lord Jesus, comfort the sick. Soothe the sorrowful. Bind up the wounded. Calm our spirits. Ease our burdens. Mend our hearts. Come, Lord Jesus, bring your justice, bring your righteousness, bring your goodness. Reorder our priorities, direct our vengeance. Strengthen our resolve, break down walls, dismantle oppression. Overthrow silence. Come, Lord Jesus, bring your hope, your tenderness, your promise. Build up our common life. Brighten our darkness. Release us, renew us, redeem us. Come, Lord Jesus, hear our cry, whisper, hear our prayers. May the Spirit be at work in our world and in our hearts. Transform, transform each of us and the world as we await Christ's return. And with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day to our need, and to give us our gifts, and we forgive us. And give us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the It is with gratitude for God's faithfulness to each of us and thanksgiving for all that we have received from God's hand that we return our portion of our livelihood back into God's service. Also, our Christmas joy offering is to use the envelope. In your bulletin and leave your offering in the box at the rear of the sanctuary. And we have another special piece from the bell choir for Christmas. <laughs>
Thank you. 